Hey, today we're launching a brand new summer long expository verse by verse series on the gospel of John. Now, now why so much John? Well, because John wrote about Jesus and Jesus is the most influential person who ever lived. And that's, you know, saying something because, I mean, there's some contenders out there, you know, like the guy who died a few years ago, Steve Jobs. I mean, Jobs had incredible influence. I mean, how many of you own an Apple product, right? <laughs> I mean, huge influence. I mean, there's little doubt that the release of the iPhone in 2007 has forever changed the way people relate to each other. I mean, we're kind of the screen generation now, huge influence. And then of course, there's this guy, Johnny Cash massive influence in the music scene, huge crossover appeal to people of all musical taste. I mean, Johnny Cash even appeals to people of no musical taste, right? And then there's the most influential comedian of all time, Bob Hope, massive influence, this guy. And you know, it, it's kind of sad that, that we lost all three of these men in the same period. I mean, you think about it. Now we have no jobs, no cash, and no hope. <laughs> Welcome to America. You know, seriously, as influential as these people are, and this is true of all people, the minute they die, their influence wanes. It dissipates. But that's not true of Jesus. I mean, when Jesus dies, his influence grew. You think about it. When Jesus was alive, his influence affected thousands. Today, it's billions. Yaroslav Pelikan, professor of history over at Yale, put it like this. Regardless of what anyone may personally think or believe about him, Jesus of Nazareth has been the dominant figure in the history of Western culture for the almost 20 centuries. I mean, he literally changed the world in a multiplicity of ways. Take equality. Before Jesus, in the ancient world, no one was equal ever. Cicero, the ancient Roman lawyer and statesman said, rank must be preserved to make sure nobody is treated equally. But then God comes along and says, and this is Galatians 3.28, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free man. There's neither male or female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. It was a brand new concept in the history of the world. But you know, it's not just equality. Think about how kids were treated in the ancient world. Seneca, a Roman philosopher said, we drown children at birth when they're weak or abnormal. I mean, many kids were treated like unwanted animals, right? In Jesus's day, men paid no attention to children. And if a man didn't want a child, he could just simply set the kid outside and abandon them. I mean, it was common. But along comes Jesus, who elevates kids when he says, and this is Mark 10, 14, let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these little children. Jesus shifted the paradigm. Think, I mean, it's so different for kids today. We've got child labor laws. We've got a massive investment in schools and education. We've got all kinds of protections from abuse and mistreatment. I mean, it's not perfect, but it's a far cry from treating kids like unwanted kittens. And Jesus' compassion spilled out into all kinds of places. The evangelist Louis Palau said Christians established the first charitable hospitals, the first homeless shelters, the first homes for orphans, the first outreaches to prisoners, hospital patients, and soldiers, and the first societies for the prevention of the cruelty to animals. Plus, think about the value of forgiveness that Jesus spread. You know, the first woman professor over at Princeton University, Hannah Arndt, said the discoverer of the role of forgiveness in human affairs was Jesus. Listen, so much has been influenced by Jesus. In the U.S. Library of Congress, you'll find 17,239 books about Jesus. And you might think, well, you know, I don't know if Jesus is still all that popular. It's the 21st century. But the author Philip Yancey said in the last 30 years, more books have been written about Jesus than in the previous 19 centuries combined. Another writer put it like this, Jesus, he's inspired the founding of more universities, more hospitals, more charities, the creation of more songs and more art, and has inspired more people to sacrifice than anyone else in history. And so with that introduction, we're gonna devote ourselves this summer to one question. Here it is, who is Jesus. And certainly to get a full view of Jesus, you've got to look at him like a diamond, admiring his facets from many, many angles. I mean, that's why we have four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But this summer, we're going to focus on John's viewpoint of Jesus. We're going to look at it from his side. And like many books in John, there's this foundation building happening in the early chapters. Chapters 1 to 12 cover a three-year period. 
And the next five chapters, they happen over a three-week period. And the last three chapters happen over three days. So the book just like speeds up as you read it. And I'd encourage you to do that this summer. Read the Gospel of John once a week, and you'll really take your spiritual growth to a new level. You'll saturate your mind with the story of Jesus by reading the Gospel of John every week. Now make sure it's the Gospel of John. John wrote five New Testament books. The Gospel of John, it's the longest one. And then 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, those are the short letters. And then the book of Revelation was written by John. We're reading the Gospel of John, not 1st, 2nd, or 3rd John. And John's Gospel has the most unique beginning. We're going to hit that next week. And at the end, he explains why he wrote the Gospel. This is John chapter 20, verse 31. He says, These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you might have life in his name. So, you know, kind of a spoiler to the book. But basically, what this means is that when you figure out who Jesus is, it's just going to change your life. And that's what we're going to do this summer. You're going to read it every week. We'll teach it, and life change will happen amongst us. Hey, today... I'm going to teach the entire book. I mean, we're going to be here till Tuesday. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm going to give you an overview. Like if we flew over the whole book and we looked at it from like 39,000 feet above, right? That's what I'm going to do. In John's gospel, what we're going to see today is that he tells the story of Jesus to communicate four big ideas. First, John wants you and I to know who Jesus is. And what's shocking is this. John doesn't start with Jesus' baptism like Mark does, or go all the way back to Jesus' birth like Luke does, or even all the way back to Old Testament genealogies like Matthew does. No, John goes as far back in introducing Jesus that you can't go any further. Here's John 1.1. He says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And just in case we don't understand that the Word here is Jesus, John tells us that in verse 14. He says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us, and we have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. You know, most cults reject that. But God's crystal clear. Jesus is God. Which means all of life should be about Him. Hey, Billy Graham put it like this. When I want to know What God is like, I just take a good long look at Jesus Christ. And friends, that's what we're going to do in this series. It's the first thing John wants us to know, who Jesus is. Second, John wants you to know, and this is John 1, 17, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. In other words, grace and truth, both of them are essential. You know, Lisa and I, we grew up on the West Coast, and when you drive over the Golden Gate Bridge, it's hard to miss that there's two massive towers that rise up out of the ocean floor to hold the bridge up. I mean, without the towers, the bridge would collapse into the sea. Grace and truth do that for the Bible. They hold it up. Both are important. Both are necessary. You'll notice whenever you see these two words in the Bible, grace, though, always comes first. Every time. In other words, whenever you feel led to deliver some truth to somebody, you know, you got to tell them the truth about how they're all messed up and need correction. Grace, it has to take the lead. You can't just take pot shots at people with truth and say, well, it's the truth. You need to hear it. Well, yeah, they do. But grace is where you should start. Only immature Christians mess this up. You know, some like to take truth and like beat people over the head with it. (laughs) Others people, they they want to be liked so much they don't ever get to truth. No, just like the Golden Gate Bridge needs both towers, you and I need both grace and truth. And churches must get this right. You can have a truth church and just judge everyone, beat them over the head with the Bible and and, in truth. but, But Or you can have a grace church and just be nice to everybody, but never tell them the truth. Neither is healthy. Both grace and truth are necessary. Here at The Point, we've got one hand on the Bible and the other hand on loving people. One hand on truth, the other on grace. Both are necessary. For example, four college kids, they show up an hour late to their final exam, and they beg their professor, "Eh, please, please let us take the exam later. They say, you know, we were out at the lake, we weren't drinking, we weren't partying or anything, and we saw it was time to come back, so we left on time, but, but you know how it is, prof. On the way back, we had a flat tire. And so we were late. And the professor, she's tough, but she was also very gracious. So she said, well, you know, I suppose that could happen to anyone. I'm I'm so sorry it happened to you guys. I tell you what, I'll reduce the final exam down to one question for you four guys. And she puts them in four separate rooms, 
hands him a sheet of paper and says, which tire went flat? <laughs> and they failed. I mean, that's grace and truth in a nutshell, isn't it? You ever fake a flat tire? I mean, God knows. And God holds grace and truth perfectly in balance. See, truth without grace is mean. But grace without truth is meaningless. All right. Third big truth that arises from John's gospel. Again, it's at the end of the book. It's chapter 20, verse 30. It says, Jesus did many other miracles in the presence of his followers that are not written in this book. But these that are written here are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And then by believing, you might have life through his name. Hey, look at that phrase, so that you may believe. Look at that phrase, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That's what this is about. In John eleven twenty five, 25, he says, I'm the resurrection. I'm the life. Those who believe in me will have life, even if they die. Do you see the connection there between resurrection and life? Every time John talks about faith, he's saying, if you've got faith, it's going to change your life. In other words, what you believe about Jesus and who he says he is, is going to directly impact your life. This is the third big theme of this book, that authentic faith leads to life transformation. Hey, think about it like these two words, here and there. Listen, everybody on the planet is asking one question. How do I get from here to there? If I'm discouraged here, how do I live with hope there? If I'm single here, how do I get married there? If I'm broke here, how do I get to surplus there? No matter what the issue, we want to know, how do I get from here to there? Here to there is a major biblical theme. The Bible says, if you're stuck here, you can be thriving there. If you're in the wilderness here, you can be in the promised land there. If you're blind here, you can see there. If you're sad here, you can have joy there. Here to there, it's everywhere in the scriptures. And by the way, all of business, all of church leadership, all of personal leadership is all about here to there. And if you're a good leader, you must first help people understand they don't want to stay here. Here's no good. No, they want to get there. There is so much better. So leadership, it's really the art of leading people from here to there. And before you think I hit a rabbit trail, the fuel from here to there is always one thing. Faith. No one gets from here to there without faith in the middle, without believing in a better way. Make sense? You see, faith is not a cliche. Faith is the root from here to there. If you want to be free of fear, you've got to have faith in God's power. If you want to be free of anxiety, you've got to have faith in God's promises. If you want to be free of guilt, you've got to have faith in God's grace. If you want to be free of loneliness, you've got to have faith in God's presence. In other words, when you increase your faith, you get less fear, less anxiety, less guilt, and less loneliness. The more you get to know Jesus, the healthier you become. By the way, did you know you're in a here to their church? You know, many churches never move past here. They're self-centered. They're self-focused. But ever since day one, we've been about reaching our city, our nation, our world. Every month, 15 years now in a row, we're focused on the fort, you know, and missional towards our world. You know, you've brought backpacks and blankets, shoes and flip-flops, socks and school supplies, baseball mitts and building supplies, even giving your blood for this city. And you know what? You've jumped on planes and buses to take the gospel beyond Fort Wayne, beyond our nation, to other cities like San Salvador, Tepecoyo, Apopa, Bamboo, Cutepeque, San Alfonso, San Miguel, Uscomanagors, Riga, Erbil, Tarak, Harabacoa, Chapala, Capsuar, Hijabe, 15 cities in 15 years. Your authentic faith has not only transformed your life, it's transformed the lives of so, so many others. You know, during the pandemic, you rose and adopted an entire village of kids in Holeta, Ethiopia, and even more kids from Adi Ababa. You, church, will change a city in one generation. In 2017, you transformed your church campus to make room for more, and you added a 12,000 square foot children's building. Listen, faith, it transforms. Today, I want to introduce you to two new here to there opportunities. You know, 40 years ago, an organization called New Tribes discovered the Tuglatil tribe in Indonesia, and they found that the Tuglatil tribe did not have a Bible in their language. Imagine trying to understand who God is without a Bible. Well, this organization said, here, the Tugatils have confusion. Here, they're in darkness. 
here. They got no Bible at all. And they decided, along with the local church in Tuglatil, to learn the Tuglatil language and translate the Bible into that language. Two of our attenders here, Bob and Debbie Clark, joined that project 20 some odd years ago. And they lived among the Tuglatil tribe. They learned the idiosyncrasies of their language. And they began the long and tedious process of getting them from here to there, of codifying their language and creating a Bible for them. A few weeks ago, Lisa and I were out to dinner with the Clarks, and they showed us the outcome of 40 years of labor. The first Bible ever printed in the Tuglatil language. Since then, they've raised funds to print Bibles for everybody in the tribe who wants one. They've even created digital Bibles. And this fall, they're going to travel there to Tuglatil once again to present them with thousands of Bibles in their own language. It's stunning. When we heard their story, we asked them, hey, tell us about the church that, that sacrificed for four decades to get a Bible in their language. And they say, wait, that church is thriving. But they've run out of room to put people. They've sacrificed so much to get the Bibles printed that they need now to build more space. And curious, we asked them, this church in the jungle, like how much would it take to like build their space out? A few weeks later, they had the answer, $20,000. And Lisa and I, we looked at each other and we thought, well, here's this church ready to celebrate the labors of 40 years of sacrifice. And here are two attenders right here in our own church who've been at the helm of this operation for 20 years who are bringing these Bibles to them. And we thought, what if we, what if we, the Point Church, were to take up an offering this summer so that when Bob and Debbie go to deliver the Bibles, they could also deliver the finances to build out their building. I mean, isn't that how God operates? You, you think you're going to celebrate 40 years of sacrifice? You think you're going to jump up and down for Bibles? But listen, you can't outgive God and you certainly can't outgive his people. So what if we Hoosiers were to present them with all the funds that they've sacrificed over the years so that when they get these Bibles, they will also get the funds to build a place to preach about the God of that Bible. I mean, what do you think, church? Can we help them get from here to there? Listen, I know we can. And I know some of you are aware that we've got our own building needs. I mean, many of you know we need a new sign out on Bass Road. Ours has seen its day. <laughs> and I've kind of let it get that way because the county has told us they're going to tear our sign down when they expand Bass Road this fall. So we're going to need funds for a sign ourselves this summer. And to prepare for that day, we have plans for a 15-foot tall, two-sided LED sign that's going to help our community get connected to what God is doing in our midst. To get this sign put up, we're going to need $50,000. And while that sounds like a lot, if you realize signs have like a minimum useful life of 10 years, that means the real cost is like less than $100 a week to have a first-class sign communicating what God is doing in our midst. And you know, between the Tuglatil project and the sign project, our need is $70,000. And this summer, I want to ask you, would you give above and beyond your normal giving to support these two projects? You know, some of you, you got significant resources. You could write a check for 10000 or more. Others of you, you could give 1000 or 5000 So others of you might give 100 or 250 Others of you could give 15 or, or $10 a week. It's not about equal giving. It's about equal sacrifice. You know, I think, church, we could get this done this summer, don't you? Help this community in Indonesia and help our own community hear about Jesus Christ and what he's doing here at the point. Would you help? You can give to the Here to There project by just writing Here to There on your check or by checking the Here to There box on your digital giving. I know he'll probably give more than we need and faster than we think. You always do. But listen, when we choose to give, that kind of authentic faith transforms lives, not just here, but around our world. So let's do this, church. Let's blow the minds of this church in Indonesia, and let's get this sign thing fixed as well. They'll be rejoicing in heaven because of all the people that come to Christ here and there, all due to your giving. Authentic faith leads to life transformation. Faith, it should affect how we live, which means if I'm a Christian, I should have a transformative effect on the hurting and hopeless around me and around our world. Jesus did, and listen, we're his followers all right, fourth big truth that we find in the book of John is in the final chapter. The resurrected Christ says this. This is John 21, 15. Jesus, he says to Simon Peter, hey, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Oh, yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. You know, Peter, he had ran away and he had denied Jesus three times. But here in the final chapter, we learn it's the last big truth of this book. Number four. It's never too late to come to Jesus. I love 
love this about God, don't you? The sun rises in John 21, and Peter, he's let God down. Have you ever let God down? You ever done something that you know has disappointed God? Jesus meets him on the seashore, cooks up some breakfast, and he never brings up Peter's past. Instead, he asks him three present tense questions and gives him three times a future tense assignment. Not once does he remind Peter of his past. And Peter goes on to be the first pastor of the first church, and he changes the world. You know, when the great American writer Mark Twain got to the end of his life, he was filled with fame, yet he was riddled with guilt. And at the end of his days, Twain wrote, There is no God. There's no universe, no human race, no earthly life, no heaven, no hell. It's all a dream, a grotesque and foolish dream. Nothing exists but you, and you are but a thought, a vagrant thought, a useless thought, a homeless thought, a wandering forlorn among the empty eternities. What's the Gospel of John about? What is the story of Jesus that we're about to bark upon this summer? Well, it's the exact opposite of what Twain's saying. The story of Jesus tells us life is real. We are real. God is real. And that we're not homeless, wandering vagrants, but we're undeserving children with a father's home where we are welcomed, embraced, and even celebrated. The story of Jesus, it's designed to heal your image of God, to heal your image of yourself, and heal your image of your future. Because with faith, all things are possible to those who believe. What should you believe? Well, here it is, right from the most amazing story of Jesus. It's the most famous verse in the Bible, the verse that makes an appearance at every NFL game. You know it, John 3, 16. Say it out loud with me, will you? And for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Pray with me, would you? God, we thank you for an opportunity to study Jesus. This summer, God, help us to dive deep into his life, into his story, into why he came. We want to know more about your son. Jesus, we want to know more about you. And so reveal yourself to us. Maybe that's what he's been doing right here as you've been watching. Maybe you've sensed that, hey, Jesus is real. And listen, if you want to get connected to Jesus right now, just tell him, Jesus, I'm sorry. I've left you on the outside of my life. Today, I'm inviting you on the inside. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again. I want to follow you. Would you pray that? Say, Jesus, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I want to follow you. Friends, the word of God says when you pray that prayer, Jesus Christ comes into your life. It's the most fantastic transformation you'll ever experience. And God, we thank you. We thank you for every person that's prayed that prayer. We thank you, God, for this opportunity to go through the story of Jesus. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, friends, next week we're going to get started with John 1.1. And we're going to go all the way through this amazing story of Jesus. And let me remind you of two things you can do. First, read the book of John every week this summer. Oh, this book is just going to bless your life. And second, get out your card, get out your checkbook, log into our website and give. Give to your church and give to the Here to There Project so we can help this church in Indonesia and get this sign thing fixed at our campus. 70 grand is the goal, and I know we're going to knock that out before the summer is done. Here's Deanna with the details. Hey there! Thank you so much for watching and checking us out. Hey, I want you to know we go live every Sunday, 9, 10, 15, and 11, 30. So I would love for you to like and subscribe to make sure that we can stay connected together all the time. I'll see you next time. Bye.